everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm glad to see you all here this evening. My name is Renee, and uh, glad to have you all here in person. And welcome to those of you who are watching via live stream as well. Um, tonight, Eric Fuselet will discuss the science behind companion planting and which native plants to include in or near a vegetable garden to attract beneficial insects and pollinators to get the most out of your garden. Eric is an environmental scientist at Olson, where he works with civil engineers and landscape architects to minimize the environmental impact from the infrastructure projects they design. Eric is a former president and current vice president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society. He also serves on the national board for Wild Ones, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes. Wild Ones is a volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. Thank you for being here, Eric. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Renee. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. Looking forward to discussing a topic that I uh, haven't previously given a program on before. Uh, so I had to do some research to kind of learn a lot about this particular topic myself. Um, will I get any feedback if this is on? Or it sounds like maybe the mic is, but okay, good. All right. Um, yeah, and just uh, to kind of give a little caveat here, I am a plant person. I am not as much of an insect person, so I won't be able to answer a ton of questions when it comes to the insects. Uh, but um, I'm relying heavily on the research uh, conducted by two different individuals uh, here, uh, which I'll talk about uh, as we go through the presentation. But as Renee mentioned, uh, with an organization called Wild Ones Native Plants Natural Landscapes, uh, we have 70 chapters across 27 states, including one here uh, in Northwest Arkansas, which we call the Ozark chapter. And we have about 90 members in our chapter. Um, I'll tell you here in a little bit how you can join if you happen to be interested. Oh, I'm gonna turn on my uh, clicker. All right. We offer monthly educational programming, uh, typically on the first Thursdays of each month. Uh, when we have our um, inside indoor programming, we try to schedule that, those at the uh, Springdale Public Library. Uh, we do have them uh, from 11.30 to 1 p.m. Uh, it's 11.30 to noon is going to be a social hour, and then noon to 1 is when we have our uh, uh, whoever the, the topic of the month is. Uh, in May, though, we will be uh, on the first Thursday of the month from 11.30 to 1, we'll be visiting Compton Gardens in Bentonville, so feel free to come out and join us. These are free and open to the public. We also have a quarterly journal. Uh, you can access this uh, uh, for free. You don't have to be a member. And we also have a site visit committee. You can go to our website uh, and request, fill out a form and somebody will come out to your place, spend about an hour with you trying to uh, determine what native plants would go well uh, in a particular part of your yard. Uh, this has been our most successful program. Uh, we've helped out, oh, I don't know, probably, you know, more than 50 or 60 different residents in Northwest Arkansas, um, was just helping them get their native plants established and uh, getting them started in direction to go in. And that is a free service that we offer. And if you're interested in joining our chapter or the organization, if you're watching, watching this on the internet and you want to find out if there's a chapter near you, just go to members.wildones.org slash join, and you can join online. Uh, there's a a scale on the fees, so um, you can join for as low as $25 for those who are on limited income um, or you know fixed income. So, all right. So let's get to the topic of the day: companion planting. What is companion planting? Uh, this refers to planting different species in proximity to each other for any variety of reasons. This could be for pest control, pollination, uh, providing habitat for beneficial insects, maximizing use of space, or to otherwise increase crop productivity. Uh, the two that we're going to be focusing more on in this talk will be pest control and pollination services for uh, vegetable and fruit gardens. But just to kind of give an example of the three sisters, many people have probably heard of this. Uh, this is, was a common uh, form of companion planting for uh, efficient use of space that the uh, certain Native American tribes would employ where they would use corn, squash, and beans as a trellis for the beans to climb up, 
uh, the squash grew around the bottom of the corn stalks and um, this um, yeah that's a form more of a less of a I mean these species of course Let's talk about beneficial insects. What are beneficial insects? Many people don't always understand uh, that, you know, insects play a role in the world. You know, a lot of people feel that insects are just provide a lot of services to humankind from pollination of our food crops. Uh, we rely, I mean, it's free services. I can't remember what sector of the economy is provided for. Uh, I mean, the percentage, uh, but there's some, you know, USDA has quantified it. Uh, how much uh, free value uh, just insects such as pollinators uh, provide um, you know, so that we can have food to eat, but also for pest control, controlling insect pests, and I'll go into that here in a little while. So we'll start off with the pollinator services. Here you have a, a bee. This segment, uh, I'm really going to be relying heavily on the research uh, provided by uh, Mark Arducer. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. He is a native bee biologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation. And he has provided some research and did a little write-up uh, for Grow Native, uh, Native Plants. Um, it's another, uh, it's, uh, the education wing of the um, Missouri Prairie Foundation. Uh, but yeah, I'm relying heavily on uh, this um, what he published here, kind of put it in, into a presentation format. So if you're interested in going straight to get this information, go to grownative.org. Uh, you can poke around on there and find resources. So according to Mark, uh, we depend on pollinators for most of the vegetables and fruits that we enjoy from farms and our own gardens. Uh, by transferring pollen from the flowers of the same species of fruits and vegetables, fertilization occurs and makes fruit and seed development possible. So non-native honeybees, while they are important uh, for pollinating many of our food crops, we also have many native species of bees um, that are also significant as pollinators as well. Uh, for example, squash bees are vital, vital for squash flower pollination. Uh, native bees not only need nectar and pollen from fruit and vegetable flowers, but also from many native flowers as well. So you can help support the native bees and other pollinators by planting a variety of native wildflowers and native flowering shrubs and trees, including close to your vegetable garden. You're going to bring in, attract certain native bee species uh, with your, uh, by providing the, the species they like. Uh, so if you are able to pair uh, the species that are going to pollinate specific uh, vegetables or fruits, depending on what you're growing, uh, then you could uh, also select certain native species that would bring in those specific pollinators. So we'll go through a, a few different uh, fruits and vegetables here. Start off with strawberries. Uh, according to Mark, uh, these are pollinated by medium-sized bees. Uh, he has the, the genus listed here, or he provided the genus. Like I said, I'm not as much, as much of an insect person, but uh, doing some online research provided some photos of these different species. So what are some native plants that would attract the types of bees that would pollinate uh, strawberries? Well, these include Pacara species. Around here we have golden ragwort. It likes full sun to part shade. And notice the sun symbols up there in the uh, left-hand corner of the slide. Uh, that's uh, Sometimes you'll just see a full sun, and that means it likes full sun as a handling of shade, or it'll have a full sun, but also some part shade as well. Hairy phacelia. Another species that will attract the species of bees that will pollinate your strawberries. Common sink foil. This is a, a sprawling plant. It would make great ground cover. does not get very tall. Uh, pale beard tongue. And I also want to say that I'm more than happy to share these slides with anyone after the talk. So if you, if you don't feel like you have to write everything down, if you, if, you know. We can share my email with you and we can swap slides. Wild hyacinth. It's, uh, it's blooming currently. New Jersey tea. It's a great shrub. You can also use the leaves of this plant uh, to make tea. It does not contain caffeine though. Golden Alexander. 
All right, so what about blackberries and raspberries? Well, uh, Mark says that these are pollinated by small, medium, and large bees, everything from bumblebees to uh, the, spe the different genera of bees uh, shown here. Also note that a lot of our are ground dwelling as well, so um, just keep that in mind as you're managing your property. You know, if you're wanting to attract bees, um, you know, uh, just understand that some of these might come from the ground. Uh, and if you, you know, uh, react uh, surprised by that and some people might, you know, become alarmed and spray them, uh, then you're kind of, you know, defeating the purpose. So just kind of, if this is something you want to try, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, here's some other genera of bees that are, well, are pollinators of our blackberries and raspberries. And again, wild hyacinth will attract these different bees, native bees. Jacob's Ladder, one of my favorite spring flowers. Pale Beard Tongue again, one of our native pinstamens. New Jersey Tea. Blue Wild Indigo, one of our Baptisias, as well as another Baptisia, Cream False Indigo. Now this is herbaceous, it grows and it looks like a shrub, but um, it will die back to the ground each year. Cream False Indigo, and Yellow Wild Indigo. All right, so what about blueberries? Well, Mark says these are pollinated by uh, medium to large size bees. Uh, and the examples that he gives are from these genera that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. I'll rely on him for that. It uh, looks like uh, he has, how many did he list? About 10 different genera of bees uh, that will pollinate our wild blueberries. Oh, needed to take that slide out. All right, so Monarda punctata, or spotted bee balm, hence the name bee balm. Apparently bees do like this. I do know the Monardas are good. Uh, they like to attract butterflies as well. And it's in the mint family, so you could make a tea from the leaves. Uh, it smells good too. Wild hyacinth. Wood betony. It's one of my favorite spring species. Then our blue stars here in uh, our part of the world, we have Arkansas blue star, or Amsonia hubrechtii. It's great for native plant landscaping, as well as eastern blue star. Eastern red bud. These are, have been flowering for the past few weeks, so they're kind of wrapping that up now. Wild geraniums. All right, so what about tomatoes? Well, again, these have these yellow flowers uh, that attract medium to large size bees. So some companion planting to attract the pollinators of tomatoes include tall Coreopsis, Coreopsis tripteris, which likes full sun. Same as obedient plant, also likes full sun. Call it bend parts of it and it'll stay bent, kind of wiry. Germander also likes full sun. Foxglove beard tongue. It's one of my favorite beard tongues. There's a false stamen inside the flower uh, that has these uh, little hairy looking things on there, like a hairy tongue, hence the name beard tongue. But, you know, whenever I've had a rough day, sometimes I like to go out to my garden and look at those and it just gives me a chuckle. So, I don't know why. Purple prairie clover, Dahlia purpurea. Also likes full sun. Then getting into those species that like uh, that can handle more shade, lead plant, amorphic canescens, also known as false indigo or false uh, indigo bush. Blue wild indigo, different uh, species and genus than the uh, previous plant. This is again one of the Baptisias. Wild bergamot, another Monarda. Uh, called wild bergamot because uh, you can mix the leaves with uh, black tea uh, to make your own bergamot tea. Has a you know an orange citrusy kind of scent to it. Uh, it's in the mint family, and same genus as uh, that spotted bee balm. Pale purple coneflower. All right, so about peppers. Medium to large bees, according to Mark. Some of those different 
genuses or genera of medium to large bees that help pollinate peppers. So again, tall Coreopsis, Mark says, will attract these specific genera of bees as well as obedient plant. Again, that foxglove beard tongue. Germander. Purple prairie clover. Blue. Lead plant, again. Wild bergamot. Purple cone flower. And some of these you're going to see listed over and over again. And what I want you to take from some of that is, you know, that that's a species that's pretty beneficial for a variety of different uh, vegetables and fruits. So what about eggplant? Bumblebees, um, Lassioglossum and Agochloropsis, according to Mark, are the uh, native bees that pollinate eggplants. And he lists these species that are able to attract these particular Bees, uh, foxglove beard tongue, tall coreopsis, obedient plant, purple prairie clover. You know, there's a white version of this as well called white prairie clover. It's uh, also in the same genus, Dahlia. Uh, I don't know if it has the same impact on being able to attract the pollinators of eggplant, but just want you to know about it. Germander. And then blue wild indigo. He lists this one specifically as opposed to this uh, wild indigos in general. Uh, lead plant. Wild bergamot. Interesting thing about this too is it does grow clonally so it will spread, naturalize really easily. Pretty easy to establish. And also a source of uh, tea for your garden has medicinal value as well. Pale purple coneflower. You know, the cone flowers are also great for just attracting all kinds of pollinators and butterflies to bees, whatnot. All right, so what about green beans? Well, Mark lists two different uh, types of bees that will pollinate our green beans, bumblebees, and I can only assume that that is Mega Chili, which is, sounds like a really awesome band name, but I don't know. It's, I'm sure it's pronounced differently than that. But common milkweed will attract these two species. Full sun, prairie blazing star, also likes full sun. Uh, this is a photo I took out at uh, Cyril's Prairie in Rogers uh, a few years ago in July, uh, especially years after they've done a burn on that prairie. It's, you know, that blazing star comes back and it's beautiful. Germander. Butterfly milkweed, or as Doug Tallamy calls it, monarch's delight. He, like, he mentions how, you know, in the native plant landscaping community, we, some of our plants have the name weed in it and makes people think, oh, you don't want that. Weed's like a plant you don't want growing. So he's trying to rebrand this one, Monarch's Delight. He, you know, that kind of describes a little more about what your, what that plant, what, what function it has ecologically. And again, we have purple prairie clover. And then getting into some more shade tolerant. Uh, we'll handle shade as well, these wild bergamot and lead plant. All right, so what about squash, zucchini, and melons? And he lists all the same different species and uh, of bees as well as um, native plants. Uh, so I, I grouped all these into a common section, but apparently the large bees in the genus, uh, or the genera, the bumblebees, the Paponepis, the Xenoglossa, and the Melissodes bimaculatus. In that particular species uh, he lists. And I believe these two, oh yeah, these are uh, squash bees. So these are uh, the two that are very important for squash plants, the uh, Xenoglossa and the uh, Pepinapis. I don't know if I said that right, but uh, Full sun is our common sunflower, Helianthus annuus. This is a native and you know the served as the you know straight species that a lot of our cultivated sunflower varieties was pulled from and it does grow native here in the ozarks uh, this photo i took down in texas Eris or tall coreopsis germander 
Monarch's Delight. Purple Prairie Clover. Just kind of be thinking if you're growing any of these garden vegetables, you know, maybe consider adding some of these native species nearby to bring in some of the pollinators. Tall Thistle. It's one of our native thistles. You can usually tell our native thistles from the non-native by the underside of the leaf will be white. Uh, and also the little spiny parts are a little more flexible and less pokey. So it's much friendlier than the non-native Rus Russian musk thistle. Wild bergamot. Lead plant. All right, so what about cucumbers? Medium to large bees, according to Mark, uh, with a variety of different genera that uh, will pollinate these cucumbers. And if we want to attract these bees, we can use uh, common sunflower. Again, tall coreopsis. Seeing some familiar species. Common milkweed. Monarch's delight. Germander. Pale purple clover. Again, our, one of our native thistles, tall thistle, Circeum altism. Mon, uh, wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa. Lead plant. All right, and finally, okra. Uh, medium to large bees. Uh, he lists uh, two specific species, this Melissodes by maculatus, as well as the... Uh, Oh, Telothrix bombiformis and the bumblebees. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, okra is in the mallow family. You can tell by the, the type of flower. has this uh, part in here that um, with all the stamens uh, that kind of comes up like that. As well as if you take the flower petals, rub between your, you know, it gets that mucilaginous feeling, kind of gets slimy. Uh, that's why uh, some people add okra as a soup thickener. It's used in gumbo often. Some people use prefer okra to gumbo filet, which is sassafras, which has the same emulsion type property. I prefer the filet to the okra. I like okra, I just don't like it in my gumbo. So it's kind of no surprise that he mentions the our native hibiscuses uh, as being that will try to attract the pollinators for wild okra, because uh, these are in the same mallow family. Uh, here we have rose mallow, and keep in mind, uh, rose mallow and especially swamp mallow are going to require uh, a lot of soil moisture, so keep it watered. Uh, this would, swamp mallow, you know, you're probably going to have an easier time growing it along the edge of a pond or in an aquascape kind of situation. Common sunflower. Tall coreopsis. Common milkweed, prairie blazing star, and he mentions the iron weeds, which is these are some you know flowers they tend to go to the summer, last half of summer. Uh, around here we have western iron weed or Vernonia baldwinii, Missouri iron weed, and giant iron weed. These are going to be the ones that you'll see in our part of the country. Uh, giant ironweed, between uh, the ironweeds, giant ironweed is going to be able to handle some partial shade. As well as tall thistle. Alright, so what about pest control? This part of the presentation, I'm going to rely heavily on the research uh, published by Heather Holm. Uh, Heather is a biologist and award-winning author, uh, pollinator conservationist, and also the author of Pollinators of Native Plants as well as a field guide on bees and another one her most recently published on wasps of Eastern North America. Um, Heather's expertise includes interactions between native pollinators and native plants and the natural history and biology of native bees and predatory wasps occur occurring within the Midwest and Northeast. She is also an honorary director of the National Wild Ones Organization. Uh, she lends her expertise to us when we're kind of developing our organization's policy. Kind of talk about a few garden pests, uh, some of the more common ones. It's good to just kind of be able to learn how to identify these. Uh, leaf hoppers, uh, these uh, are in the family uh, Cicadelliae. I believe it is because they look similar to cicadas. 
Uh, they are pests on most fruits and vegetables and they feed on plant sap. Aphids, uh, these come in a variety of colors. They can be white, black, brown, gray, yellow, light green, and even pink. Uh, small, soft-bodied insects, they suck the nutrient-rich liquids out of plants, uh, and on large numbers, they can weaken plants significantly. Uh, they multiply quickly. You can have several different generations during a summer. Uh, Ligus, a certain genera or genus of um, insects, Ligus. Uh, these feed on strawberries and on a number of vegetable crops and cross, cause serious damage to fruit orchards. Uh, thrips, this is a certain order uh, within the insect um, world. So they can be pests on onions, chives, and figs. White flies, pests on tomatoes, bell peppers, eggplants, okras, sweet potato, and cabbage. Uh, tend to feed on new growth uh, and eggs are laid on the underside of leaves so that could be a place to check for these eggs you see here in this photo so and that's just you know a brief list of common garden pests um, so it's some beneficial insects that provide pest control by uh, consuming these insects either their eggs their larvae or even parasitizing them we'll go through through these uh, green lacewings if there's going to be a uh, a particular uh, beneficial insect for pest control, uh, the lace wings. They, they hit a lot of different insect pests. So this is one to remember. Aphids, beetle larvae, caterpillars, earwigs, uh, mealybugs, mites, soft scale, all kinds of things in addition to the, the species uh, we talked about briefly before. But the eggs laid on, uh, they lay their eggs on long stalks attached to plants. Uh, then we have two different kinds, or, uh, two different families. We have the green lace wings in the family Chrysopidae, and then the brown lace wings, different family. This one targets a uh, fewer number of pests. And if we're wanting to attract these particular uh, species uh, to, for, to serve as pest control in our gardens, Heather mentions that we can grow common yarrow, which prefers full sun, has this uh, feathery like leaf. Uh, it's medicinal. Uh, the Old World varieties, uh, the same genus Achillea, it's called uh, that because it was used a lot uh, in, well, in stories about Achilles, but Roman soldiers uh, would carry the leaves and use it as a poultice when they were wounded. Uh, it has a lot of medicinal value, very distinct smell if you take a leaf, crush it, and smell it. Daisy fleabane, often considered pretty uh, weedy by most, but just keep in mind it does attract lace wings. So if you have this around your garden, you might consider leaving it. So. All right, surfid flies. These will target aphids. And this is a uh, in speaking. You know, there she mentions the subfamily Serfinae only. Uh, the adults consume flower nectar and pollen. Again, common yarrow, as well as rattlesnake master. It's a great one for a pollinator garden. Looks pretty cool. A friend of mine said she thought that this would be an awesome name for a heavy metal band, rattlesnake master. I like, tend to agree. You know. uh, called yucca folium, the species, because the leaves resemble yucca, although it's in a different you know, group of the plant kingdom altogether. Uh, this is, I believe it's uh, the sunflower family. Wild quinine, likes full sun. Virginia mountain mint. This is one of those mints that has a cooling kind of volatile oil within it. So you can make a tea with uh, the mountain mints and as opposed to having spicy oils like some other members of the mint family. Culver's root, common milkweed, purple prairie clover, a little bit of overlap with our attracting the beneficial pollinators. New England aster. Blue vervain. Gray-headed coneflower, Ratibida pinnata. So not an echinacea. Black-eyed Susan, Rebecca hirta. Sneezeweed. Stiff goldenrod, Solidago rigida. Oxi sunflower, Heliopsis helianthoides, resembles a sunflower. 
New Jersey tea. And we're getting into the ones that can handle a little bit of partial shade. Again, Daisy Fleabane. And Common Bone Set. Now, this one um, is one, if you're going to take a plant away from here to remember, this is one that hits all the, it attracts all the different beneficial insects. So it's a most bang for your buck for your garden to have this nearby. Flowering Spurge. Slender Mountain Mint. This one has less of a scent to it, but there is still a mild scent when you smell the leaves. Ohio Spiderwort. Interesting thing about this one is the flowers only bloom for a day. Uh, so it usually has a whole bunch of these flower heads on there and each one blooms for a day and then it's done. Uh, the uh, flowers and the uh, stalks are edible. Mild bergamot. Golden Alexander. And sweet black-eyed Susan, another red but a different species, Subtomentosa. Uh, I believe this might also be the, uh, maybe not. I was thinking if that was the Missouri coneflower. But anyway, wing stem. This is one of the species that produce frost flowers, or Besnia. Tachnid flies. Uh, these target beetle larvae, caterpillars, earwigs, grasshoppers, and sawflies. Uh, it's a it's parasitic, so it para, it will parasitize harlequin uh, beetles and squash beetles. Uh, females lay eggs in the host, uh, and while the rate of parasitism can be high, you typically don't see uh, the benefits of that until later in the year. So it's not something you would use for an immediate way to control a pest if it's uh, wouldn't have you know it's usually. By the time you're seeing the effect, the, the damage to the garden's already been done. So this is more of a way to control or reduce the populations of a particular insect pest in your garden area uh, over time. So just keep in mind that is more of a, a long-term strategy uh, to attract tachnip flies. But common yarrow will attract these as well as rattlesnake master and wild quinine. Virginia Mountain Mint, Culver's Root, Common Milkweed, Sneezeweed, and this one just reminds me of those flowers on Alice in Wonderland, the Disney version, the cartoon. I don't know, maybe those were daffodils, but for some reason I remember like they, they sneezed, but I can just imagine these being used for a remake. Oxide Sunflower. Rativita pinata, that gray-headed cone flower. Black-eyed Susan. Stiff goldenrod, solid dago rigida. Blue vervain. Daisy fleabane. I'm moving into the species that can handle some partial shade. Some common bone set. Again, Eupatorium perfoliatum. Flowering Spurge, this is one of our native euphorbias. Sweet Black Eyed Susan again. New Jersey Tea, and this got its name New Jersey Tea because back when the American colonialists were boycotting British tea, they were using this plant as a tea substitute. Now it does not contain caffeine, so I'd imagine they had some caffeine withdrawal, but that's just how it got its common name. We do have a native species that does contain caffeine. It doesn't grow here in the Ozarks, but it grows in southern Arkansas called Yapon Holly, or Ilex vomitoria. Uh, it was given, the story behind the species name vomitoria was more of a way to market. Um, it was chosen by somebody who had, my, or at least what I've been told, uh, who had some stake in the Dutch Indian Trading Company. And so they're trying to discourage people from drinking uh, Yapon Holly tea for caffeine because you know it grew all over the place here. Uh, so that they would buy black tea uh, from the Dutch Indian Trading Company. Um, it was so a botanist decided to name it Ilex vomitoria because the natives would use it in a drink mixture uh, that they would use ceremonially uh, that would cause vomiting. It wasn't necessarily the Yapon holly that was causing the vomiting, but it was as part of uh, the experience. I don't know what all was in the mixture, but you know maybe similar to like a you know 
at least a vomiting would be a similar element to like the ayahuasca ceremonies in South America, but without knowing what was in the drink, couldn't tell you what was causing that. Slender Mountain Mint. All right, and soldier beetles. If you see any of these, uh, they're good to have. They'll take care of aphids. Uh, especially, um, <clears throat> I notice these on my golden rods in my garden each year. Uh, at first, I'll see aphids, and they'll just cover my golden rods. And then uh, I'll just give it time, and ladybugs and these things will move in, and they'll just eat up the aphids. So just keep in mind, uh, it takes time. So it's not going to be immediate, but uh, it will take care of those pests. Beetle larvae, caterpillars. Uh, the larvae of these soldier beetles search for prey and leaf litter on plants and in the soil. So they're down there looking for the things that might get in your garden. Swamp milkweed will attract these, as well as common yarrow. Rattlesnake master. Culver's root. Milkweed. Did I have that already? Um, purple prairie clover. I think I'll swamp milkweed. Again, sneezeweed. Oxide sunflower. Gray headed coneflower. Black eyed Susan. Stiff goldenrod. Blue vervain. Oxide, or I'm sorry, daisy flea vein. And again, that common bone set, Eupatorium profoliatum, flowering spurge, Ohio spiderwort, sweet black eyed Susan, slender mountain mint, yellow wing stem, Verbesnia alternifolia, again, one of our frost weeds, wild bergamot. And then there are thynid and scolid wasps. These will go after beetle larvae. This obviously is trying to mimic a bee. Some of our the thynid wasps uh, can look similar to hornets or bees. Rattlesnake master will attract these, as will wild quinine. And this uh, was used uh, for quinine uh, to give to soldiers uh, during the Confederacy, I believe, um, or during the, the Confederate soldiers would use this in the South during the Civil War uh, as a quinine uh, adulterant. Virginia Mountain Mint, Common Milkweed, Swamp Milkweed, and keep in mind with this one, it does like uh, moist soil, so you'll have to, if you don't have it planted in uh, an area where the, it's going to be getting a lot of water, uh, then you'll have to make sure to water it. It's the name Swamp Milkweed, Rose and Wetlands, Oxi Sunflower, Gray-Headed Coneflower, Black-Eyed Susan, Purple Prairie Clover, Slender Mountain Mint, Stiff Goldenrod, Blue Vervain, New Jersey Tea, Common Bone Set, Flowering spurge, there's quite a few species that attract these beetle loving wasps. Sweet black eyed Susan, again our yellow wing stem. And that brings us to the Potter and Mason wasps, which are, which are a subfamily. Um, beetle larvae and caterpillars. So the most nest in cavities above ground, they hunt a variety of caterpillars. Um, you know, a lot of people do like growing pollinator gardens for the caterpillars to support butterfly populations. So, and wasps are, you know, they will prey on these, but it is part of the ecosystem and they also have their place to play. Common yarrow will track these as well as rattlesnake master, wild quinine, Virginia mountain mint, common milkweed, Swamp milkweed, 
purple prairie clover, gray-headed coneflower, black-eyed Susan, Saladago Regina, sorry, stiff goldenrod, blue vervain, and then one that can handle a little bit of partial shade, New Jersey tea, daisy fleabane, common bone set, wild bergamot, flowering spurge, and golden alexander, sweet black eyed Susan. Slender Mountain Mint, and again, Yellow Wing Stem. Then Paper Wasps. These can help control beetle larvae and again, caterpillars. A lot of people don't like Paper Wasps. You see the nest, you tend to knock it out from under your porch. I can understand that, especially if it's by the door. But uh, if it's, you see a Paper Wasp nest somewhere where it's not bothering you, you know, just keep in mind it has its place in the ecosystem and just let it be. Um, it's out there, it's helping your garden out as well. Common yarrow will attract these, as well as rattlesnake master. A lot of these same species, I'm just going to kind of move through here for the sake of time. Gray headed coneflower, and again, more than happy to send the resources to you so you have it as a reference. See if we have any new species in this section. Not so much. Okay, so for further reading, um, really want to recommend these two books. These are great. This is the one by Heather Holm, uh, Pollinators of Native Plants. If you're really interested in you know, learning how to attract, observe, and identify pollinators of beneficial insects uh, with native plants, this is a great guide. Uh, especially if you want to yeah, make that between the insect world and the plant world. Also, the Xerces Society uh, publishes Farming with Native Beneficial Insects. So it's all about ecological pest control solutions. Uh, it goes into different uh, planting design techniques, ways to provide uh, habitat, beetle mounds, all sorts of things um, uh, to incorporate into your garden or farming system uh, to be able to use pest control. Uh, as opposed to uh, pesticides, uh, insecticides, and whatnot. And if you're wanting to learn more about Wild Ones, uh, I encourage you to go to our website, ozark.wildones.org is our uh, chapter website. We're also on social media, Facebook, Instagram. We're even on TikTok. We're trying to be cool. So uh, we're trying. I'll say that. We're trying. Uh, but we do have some videos up there. Uh, as good of videos as you can have on pollinators written by some people in, you know, middle age of life. Our YouTube channel, we have a lot of over uh, during the pandemic that were recorded and placed up on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you to go there and check it out. Uh, if you want to send an email to wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com, I'll be happy to send you the slides for this program as well as the other information, uh, the Grow Native Flyer, all that sort of stuff. And if you're interested in joining, um, yeah, we'd love to have you in our organization, members.wildones.org slash join. And with that, uh, conclude this presentation. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Less of an insect person, more of a plant person. Just to put that caveat there. But. Where did you say you guys were going to be this month? Or yeah. Yeah, uh, it'll be, yeah, in May, the first Thursday, we'll be at Compton Gardens in Bentonville. So the grounds manager, a horticulturalist supervisor there is going to be giving us a tour, uh, kind of talking about some uh, op uh, opportunities to help out out there. So they're always looking for volunteers. If you're wanting to learn more about landscaping with native plants, they'll let you come help their, you know, their crew out there and you can get some experience. So, Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for coming. Oh, oh yes, yes. How do you spell the name of that tea that's from Southern Arkansas? Oh, Yaupon. Y A U P O N. Thank you. Yep. And the scientific name Ilex I L E X. It's a genus uh, species Vomitoria V O like vomit V O M I T O R I A. I believe. So. So, yes, sir. So, um, how, how can we access this, um, these slides and stuff at our house? 
Uh, I could send it to you as a PDF if, if you open it up on a computer. I believe this was also recorded and you can uh, view it on uh, Fayetteville Public Library's YouTube channel. I think they put it on Vimeo also if you want to rewatch it. Uh, but yeah, happy to send you the slides as a PDF. All right, thank you all for being here and we'll, we'll see you.